Oops. <clears throat> All right, uh, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, just uh, giving a few more minutes um, to uh, wait for a few more uh, attendees. Um, we have a few more registered, so just want to give a couple more minutes for those to uh, log on. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much uh, uh, for your company uh, for the next hour or so. Um, <clears throat> my name is Jamie Pegg. I'm a, a marketing manager for um, uh, AMD Zynix here at Excel Point. Uh, we're a couple of attendees short of those uh, registered, but in the interest of um, everybody's time, um, I think uh, we'd uh, better um, kick off this session. Um, so next uh, slide, um, please, uh, Christoph. Thank you. Um, so as I just said, yeah, my name is Jamie Pegg. Uh, with me on the call today is um, Christoph Hayat, um, who's going to be doing the heavy lifting um, on this webinar. Um, Christoph is our AMD Designing Applications uh, Engineering Manager. And along with Christoph, uh, we have uh, Ali Bator, who is our AMD Signings Business Development Manager for Australia. Um, so just a bit of uh, housekeeping, really. Um, so we'll allow for about an hour, just over an hour. Um, and we will um, have a, a short uh, Q&A session um, at the end um, uh, to try and sort of uh, help uh, Christoph with his um, um, presentation, we uh, would prefer um, for any questions to be entered via the Q&A uh, chat window. That way we can record those questions and uh, any answers provided. Um, <clears throat> in the interest of time, we'll also mute um, the audience. So use that Q&A chat window. Um, if we can't answer them straight away in the chat window, then we'll endeavor to come back to, uh, to you um, uh, following the webinar. Um, next uh, slide, please, Christoph. Um, so very, very quickly, yeah, just a quick uh, slide about Excel Point. Uh, some people are not aware of uh, Excel Point in our region. Um, so Excel Point is uh, an electronic component distribution company um, headquartered um, out of Singapore. Um, we have uh, around 50 uh, sort of uh, office locations around the um, 
uh, India and ASEAN region, including uh, um, Australia and New Zealand. Um, I'm not going to go through these um, line by line, but you know, just a, key, a few key uh, manufacturers to note. Obviously, AMD Xilinx, Analog Devices, Samsung, Microchip, NXP, um, you name it. Um, so um, I have uh, the website um, at the top. Um, feel free to go and have a little browse. Um, but for now, I'd like to introduce uh, Christoph Hayert, who's going to go through um, this next series of, um, I guess, Zinc SOC um, webinars. Um, over to you, uh, Christoph. Thank you, Jamie. <clears throat> so, hello and welcome everyone to this series of webinars around the Zinc Ultrascale Plus MPSOC FPGA devices. So my name's Christoph Hayert, and I'll be your speaker for most of these sessions. Um, the series is split up in three sessions and it's suited to both hardware and software developers. We'll talk about the Zinc Ultrascale Plus MPSOC and show how to build MPSOC system from scratch using the various styling tools required to do so. During today's session, we'll introduce and discuss the architecture of the Zinc Ultrascale Plus MPSOC device, then go into the details on how to design with the IP integrator, using the Vivado design suite, as you'll need this tool under your belt in order to create and build an MPSOC system. We'll use the IP integrator to customize and build an MPSOC system, build and implement the FPGA, and finally export the hardware for further software development. Now, just, just a note here that, that some of the underlying fundamentals of FPGA design, which include things such as RTL design, timing analysis, time enclosure, et cetera, using the Vivado design suite are outside of the scope of this series. For people that are new to FPGAs or do not have the in-depth backend experience with Vivado, you may register your interest with um, Jamie or Ali and we can build a webinar around that specific topic as well. During the next session, we'll then introduce the Vita software development environment, which can be used to build software applications on the MPSOC. So based on the hardware we'll design today, during the next session, we'll build a few basic bare metal applications on various processes within the MPSOC and, and also show some interactions with some of the peripherals included in the system we'll build today. During the final session of the series, we'll show you how you can build an embedded Linux system from scratch using the Peta Linux development tools based on the same hardware we'll design today. <clears throat> For those of you working with or planning to work with RFSOC devices, an RFSOC device houses the exact same processing system architecture as an MPSOC device with the additional inclusion of several IP blocks, obviously, um, the RF ADCs and DECs, but, but also the SD fix. So all of the content presented during this series of webinars will also apply to RFSOC devices. So let's start today's session by having a look at the Zinc Ultrascale Plus MPSOC FPGA architecture. The Zinc Ultrascale Plus MPSOC is the logical next step up from the Zinc 7000 SOC devices. The Zinc 7000 offered a homogeneous processor cluster centered around the um, Cortex A9 processors. The MPSOC family, however, is also built upon a cluster concept, but with two distinct clusters for specific purposes, namely a pair of Cortex R5 processors for managing real-time applications, as well as a dual and quad-core 64-bit Cortex A53 for running various operating systems and their applications. So this allows you to enable the right mix of processor type and capability, and to be able to change this configuration on the fly. So the Zinc Ultrascale Plus MPSOC is not a simple monolithic device, but it's rather it's a tightly integrated collection of powerful capabilities. The MPSOC devices are made up of the processing system, which contains the processor cores, peripherals, and other supporting systems, as well as the programmable logic, which you can use to implement processor accelerators, peripherals, or even independent subsystems. It houses a 32-bit real-time, a pair of 32-bit real-time processors that can run independently or in lockstep for increased reliability. So these are series processors are optimized for handling real-time applications. 
depending on the version of the MPSOC device, there are either two or four 64-bit um, A53s built into the application processing unit of the PS silicon. So this powerful cluster is capable of running a single operating system, which manages some or all of the physical processor cores. This is something known as symmetric multiprocessing or SMP, or running the same or different operating systems simultaneously, something known as asymmetric processing or AMP. MPSOC leverages the technology developed for the Ultrascale Plus devices, which offer superior programmable logic capabilities, including ultra RAM memory, PCIe Gen 4 technology, 100 gigabit ethernet for superior communications capabilities. Many data and control paths between the PS and the PL offer the A53 processes the ability to run dedicated accelerators and custom peripherals. There are a number of uh, triple redundant microblaze processes implemented in the processing system silicon, which can be configured. One can be configured to perform system safety and integrity checks on boot and on demand. This, this is the PMU called Platform Management Unit, which can also run user customizable power management firmware that can dynamically control the power status of many of the power masters in the PS and the PL. The other redundant, triple redundant microblast processor is also implemented in the PS silicon and, and that constantly monitors the device for signs of tampering. So that's the configuration and security unit. So this module supports um, trust zone, encryption, decryption, and vault management. Multiple memory controllers are also available, providing easy access to DDR memory, as well as support for several types of flash memory. The MPSOC also boasts an array of low-speed peripherals, such as I2C, SPI, traditional um, low-speed peripherals, but also high-speed interfaces, such as uh, Sirius SATA, DisplayPort, USB 3.0, etc. ARM's Mali graphics processor is an ultra low power graphics engine capable of generating complete images or overlay. Okay. Sorry, folks, um, our sincerest apologies for um, the technical difficulties. Um, there seems to have been a conflict um, with another session somewhere in Singapore. So our sincerest apologies, um, we'll, 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 um, we'll move on um, shortly. Also, I think just for everybody's um, benefit, we are recording this session. Um, so we will make the session available um, following, uh, um, following this, um, so that if anything's uh, missed out, we'll have the recorded session. Um, okay, chat, okay. Q&A. Uh, uh, Christoph, maybe give it uh, one more minute, and then I would uh, I would kick off. Um, don't want to. Uh, there's a number of people that have joined back on, which is fantastic, and I do appreciate everyone's patience. Um, but I don't want to waste uh, um, anybody's uh, time further, just in case the uh, the attendees um, that have dropped off can't make it. Okay, so maybe perhaps without further ado, um, let's kick off again. And I'm not too sure how much was captured of this slide. So let's maybe just run through it again. So the Zinc Ultrascale Plus MPSOC is the logical next step up from the Zinc 7000 SOC devices, where the Zinc 7000 offered a homogeneous processor cluster, the MPSOC family, 
is built upon a cluster concept with toe clusters for specific purposes. So the, the pair of R5 processes for managing real-time applications and a dual and quad core 64-bit Cortex A53 for running various operating systems and their applications. The MPSOC devices are made up of the processing system containing the processor cores, peripherals, as well as other supporting systems and traditional programmable logic, which you can use to implement processes, processor accelerators, peripherals, as well as independent subsystem. So it houses a pair of 32-bit real-time processes that can be run independently or in lockstep mode for increased reliability. These are these five series processes are optimized for handling real-time applications. Depending on the version of the MPSOC device, or depending on which package and type, there are either two or four 64-bit ARM A53s built into the APU, the application processing unit of the processing system silicon. This powerful cluster is capable of running a single operating system, which manages some or all of the physical processor cores. This is known as symmetric multiprocessing or SMP or running the same or different operating systems simultaneously, which is known as asymmetric processing or AMP. The MPSOC leverages the technology for the ultra-scale plus devices, which offer superior programmable logic capabilities, including ultra RAM memory, PCIe Gen 4 technology, 100 gigabit ethernet for superior communications capabilities, Many data and control paths are available between the PS and the PL, which offer the A53 processors the ability to run dedicated accelerators and custom peripherals. A dedicated triple redundant microblast processor is implemented in the processing system silicon and can be configured to perform system safety and integrity checks on boot as well as on demand. That this platform management unit also called PMU, you'll, you'll hear a lot about PMU, can run user customizable power management firmware, allowing you to dynamically control the power status of many of the power masters, in, both in the PS and the PL. Another dedicated microblaze processor is implemented in the PS as silicon, and it constantly monitors the device for signs of tampering. So this is the configuration and security unit. The CSU module supports ARM Trust Zone, encryption, decryption, as well as fault management. Multiple memory controllers are also available, providing you easy access to DDR memory, as well as support for several types of flash memory. Furthermore, the MPSOC boasts an array of low-speed peripherals, such as I2C, SPI, CAN, etc., but also high-speed peripherals, such as SATA, DisplayPort, USB 3.0, etc. ARM's Mali graphics processor is an ultra low power graphics engine, which is capable of generating complete images or overlays for live video feeds. It's implemented as a dedicated silicon block in most of the MPSOC device configurations. Finally, a dedicated video codec is also available, providing coding and decoding of a number of standards, including H.264, H.265. As with a graphics processor, this video codec is also physically located at the PL and is implemented as a dedicated silicon block. So the, so the block diagram here shows that the MPSOC device can be divided into three main areas, so to speak. The, the processing system contains the processors, a fixed set of both low speed and high speed peripherals, clock management, memory blocks, internal interconnects, and memory controllers. The PS is implemented in <clears throat> dedicated silicon and, and therefore has limited configurability. And since the MPSOC is, is a processor-centric device, the PS will always boot before the programmable logic. And in fact, it is used to program the programmable logic. As mentioned, the programmable logic is based on the UltraScale Plus architecture and is a mix of different types of silicon resources, such as the traditional programmable logic elements, various types of memories, both general and specialized I.O., such as PCIe, gigabit transceivers, DSP48E modules, and analog temperature and voltage measurement units. 
getting the most out of the PS and the PL requires you to the ability to move data efficiently though between these areas and the MPSOC offers a number of AXI based interconnects for moving data and control messages between these two areas. Now we'll discuss these in a little bit more detail in one of the following slides. During this webinar series, we'll be running some basic software applications on both a Cortex A53 processor and in, in, in the application processing unit, and as well as on an R5 processor and the real-time processing unit. And we'll do that using a ZCU102 evaluation board, which I have at hand here. So it's got to talk about these processes a little bit more, but given the limited amount of time available, I won't go too much into detail here. We'll just look at some of the high level attributes. So each, each MPSOC device contains an APU or application processing unit <clears throat> in the PS. This APU represents the highest performance processor cluster in the device. And it is because it isn't just a bunch of processes either, rather it is a collection of elements that support the processor as well. So each APU contains two or four ARM Cortex A53 processors employing the ARM VA8 architecture, which focuses on low power consumption with high levels of performance. And each of these processes within the APU is supported by its own 32 kilobyte instruction cache, 32 kilobyte data cache, an MMU memory management unit, interrupt controller, a trace core for debugging, as well as math co-processing support in the form of a floating point accelerator and a non-vector, non non-neon vector processing unit. And PSOC devices are composed of four independent power domains, and three of them exist within the processing system, and the APU itself is housed in the full power domain of the processing system. So within an APU, groups of resources are gathered into what's called power islands, where all the members of an island can be controlled as a single power element. And on top of that, each major element within an island can also be independently controlled. And the power to an island can also be turned off. So, so there is a high degree of granularity of power management. So for example, with, with the full power domain powered up and the island containing the CPU is powered up, each CPU can either be running in a low powered state or completely off. Both the processes in, in the APU and the RPU can be tasked with running the first stage bootloader, which is the first user code that the system will typically run. And the first stage bootloader is auto generated as part of the fighters platform project but can be customized as needed. Now, no need to worry about this now. We will discuss the boot components of the MPSOC more in detail during the next webinar session. The real-time processing unit contains two 32-bit real-time focused Cortex R5 processors. These power-efficient processors are optimized for the needs of real-time applications, such as low latency memory access, fast responses to interrupts, deterministic behavior, etc. Unlike the Cortex-A53 processors, the R5 processors follow the ARMv7 architectures, the architecture and can be run independently or in lockstep mode for increased reliability. So lockstep mode, in lockstep mode, the code on one processor is mirrored onto the other and then the results are compared for, for to detect errors easily. These cores and their supporting systems, they're not in the full power domain, they belong to the low power domain and they can access, fully access other resources um, such as OCM, TCM and peripherals as well. A short slide on, on the programmable logic. The PL is based on the ultrascale plus 16 nanometer technology. And as, as said before, along with the traditional system logic cells, there are a variety of different types of dedicated silicon resources, which include block RAM, DSP resources, high performance and high density IOs, 
Um, additional I.O. is also available in the form of high-speed connectivity devices, including two different types of gigabit transceivers, interlocking core 100 gigabit Ethernet MAC, PCIe Gen 4. Analog input is also supported through the analog mix signal block, which can measure internal temperatures, voltages, but it can also accept voltage inputs from off devices. Now, this is where it gets kind of interesting the, because the ability to move data and key signals between the PL and PS is paramount to creating a highly efficient system. And to this end, there are no less than 12 different data paths between the PS and the PL domains to transfer data. So, so let's explore them a little bit here. The accelerated coherency port or ACP is a legacy connection from the Zinc 7000 devices. So this, this 64 or 128-bit configurable channel is, is intended to support one-way snooping between an accelerator in the program of a logic and the L2 cache in the PS. But this is otherwise known as IO coherency. This port's ideal when, when blocks of data being moved can comfortably fit in the L2 cache. So for blocks that are larger and don't fit, in the L2 cache, they must be parceled off to the DDR, but that then comes with the latency penalty. It's a slave port, which means that a master must be placed in the program of logic, such as an accelerator or even another soft core um, processor. The AXC coherency extension, ACE, is a full two-way coherent connection. This allows a master in the PL to coordinate its caches with the caches in the APU. It's a 128-bit wide path and also driven by a master in the programmable logic. Two identical high-performance coherent interfaces provide I.O. level cache coherency. So these ports are ideal for coherent high-performance DMAs of large data sets from the PL to the DDR. Each of these ports is also buffered by a FIFO, which helps you smooth the flow for I.O. throughput data streams. Four high-performance slave ports are configurable as either 32, 64, or 128-bit data widths. They're non-coherent ports, which drive directly into the DDR controller and are also best suited for moving large blocks of data between the PL and the DDR. Two PS master ports can be driven from both the APU and the RPU. These ports are configurable as 32, 64, or 128-bits wide and they're intended to drive just slaves in the PL. The PL to low power domain data path is also configurable as either 32, 64 or 128 bits wide. And they enable masters in the program of a logic to access resources in the low power domain, such as the IO peripheral block. Finally, the real-time processing unit can also drive into the PL to control an assortment of peripherals. And this, this path provides you with an opportunity to access the program of a logic when, when the full power domain is, is fully shut down, for instance. So as you can see, there are many ways to, to move data between the two domains, and, and it's obviously application specific for, for what, what you need. But, but just so that you're aware, um, there are um, 12 of these interfaces available. So. Also briefly discussed already, um, the MPSOC devices, they are divided into four power domains to facilitate efficient power utilization. The domains, they're further segmented into power islands. The platform management firmware, which runs on the PMU, on the platform management unit, so on one of those microblades processes, sets the power profile for booting, then, then use the Zill PM APIs to set the power dynamically based on requests from masters made through inter-processor interrupts. As with the first stage bootloader, so that this, this platform management software is available as a template in the Vitus IDE, and this can also be customized based on your specific needs. And then once the platform management firmware is running, Masters in either the APU, RPU, and the PL can send a message to the PMU commanding it to change how power is regulated. 
the firmware can also dynamically control power to entire regions or islands within the regions. And as also mentioned before, even individual devices um, within an island can be selectively powered up or powered down or be placed in a low powered states. So while we could keep exploring the MPSOC architecture more in depth, it, it is kind of beyond the scope of this session Rather, the goal is to design an MPSOC system rapidly to get you up and running fast. That's it. There are, there are a few links here that provide some documentation resources, which you can explore for more if you should you wish to explore more details. So now that we've had a look at the architectural overview of a Zinc MPSOC device, a device, and before designing an MPSOC system, this slide here shows you an overview of the design flow for a Zinc Ultrascale MPSOC, but, but from a system perspective. The design flow typically involves using various Xilinx tools, which may be driven by different types of developer, both hardware and software developers. So it, any FPGA, any FPGA design flow, it always involves using the Vivado design suite. And for an MPSOC embedded system, this is not different. So for a design where, where RTL and IP can be developed on, on hardware and the programmable logic alone, the Vivado design suite typically suffices. But in case of an embedded system, such as is the case with the MPSOC device, you'll be using different tools for software development, which include um, the Vitus, ID, uh, Vitus SDK, which is based on Eclipse, as well as Peta Linux development kit for building embedded Linux systems. So the general flow starts by creating and building a project using the Vivado design suite, including the PS subsystem, using the IP integrator within the Vivado IDE, then synthesizing and implementing the design onto the target architecture, or in this case, the Zinc Ultrascale Plus MPSOC, and then finally generating a bitstream. So for software development, the hardware, the generated hardware and all of its metadata is then exported to the software tools to continue software development. So how, that, how that's done will be explained and, and shown during the session. The Vitus SDK then allows software, embedded software developers to build applications to run on the MPSOC, whether standalone or in an embedded Linux system. To build the embedded Linux system, the Peta Linux tools are then used, which, which can build all the, all the software components required, such as the Linux kernel, the root file system, <clears throat> the device tree, etc., just to build a bootable Linux image. But today we will focus on the hardware design using the IP integrator within the Vivado design suite as is, as is shown here in this picture. So we'll, we'll go through configuring the, the PS. We will not really develop any RTL, but we'll add some IP and we'll, we'll build it and we'll generate a bitstream where we'll do the export. And then during the next session, we'll, we'll run, we'll create the first stage bootloader and the device tree, et cetera, and we'll run some, some applications. So what is the IP integrator? Um, I'll present a couple more slides here to provide you with an overview of the IP integrator, but we'll be working with this hands-on in a short while and start building the system. <clears throat> the IP integrator is a graphical and scriptable block-based IP connection tool, which allows you to create both processor-based and non-processor-based systems with accelerated IP integration. So either basic or compl complex IPs can be added to a diagram and graphically interconnect it using this environment. Now, the power of this, this integrated tool is that it enables interface level connections such as AXI4. Users can create, add, connect, and customize complex systems this way. The IP integrator supports all classes of designs. So it supports pure RTL logic, Favado high-level synthesis, um, system generator based designs, networking and connectivity designs, GSP designs, as well as embedded designs. It is purely a GUI-based design aid within the Vivado design suite. IPI tool uses IP from the IP catalog to piece the, together designs. And this IP can come from Xilinx, 
which has a rich set of IP available, third party, or even your own IP. You can also convert, if you have legacy RTL or HDL files, you can also convert them into IP blocks and add them into this graphical workspace. You can export designs built using the IPI tool, similarly to how you could export IP created using HDL. So here on the right hand side, you'll see a typical design flow when using the IP integrator, which starts by piecing together blocks of IP using the graphical interface, generating an HDL wrapper for it. Uh, but then it just follows the traditional FPGA design flow where you'd perform behavioral simulation to validate the functionality of the design, followed by synthesis, implementation, and bitstream generation. Here in the bottom left corner, you'll see some of the features of the Vivado IPI tool, and we'll explore some of these when designing the MPSOC system uh, in a little bit. The design canvas is simply the graphical workspace for working with block diagrams. The IP catalog available is a unified catalog with all supported IPs in one place. So it's very easy to access it by just clicking the plus button there. And then you can create ports, interface connections, just as you would be drawing a schematic, really. The block design can be saved, validated, output products can be generated all from within the design canvas. The IP integrator will also perform DRC checks for you to make sure the design's correct and, provi and provides an option to lock your placement. Design assistance is also available in the design canvas to help you create your design. This is a really nice feature and it, that, it, which really makes the tool easy to use as it, as it provides block automation and designer assistance. So, so block automation becomes available when a Xilinx processor has subsystem IP instantiated in the block design. And designer assistance is also available if the tool, for instance, determines that there is a potential connection among the instantiated IP in the canvas, and then it opens up the connection automation feature. Best results though, it, it is recommended to add as many IPs as you can at the start and then run the automation at the very end. And this is because the GUI considers the entire system when the automation is performed, which provides better results. The IP integrator also contains an address editor, just nothing more than then a tree table view that lists all, it, all its address paths. So an address path is a path in the block diagram from a master interface through an interconnected network to a slave interface. So a leaf row of the address editor represents address paths. And then the address editor toolbar allows you to control which are shown based on the three states here. So they can be unassigned, assigned, or excluded. While memory mapping of the peripherals instantiated in the block design are automatically assigned, you can, you can change you can manually assign the, the desired address should you, should you wish to do so. For users who wish to integrate their own RTL into an IP integrator's block design, there is a feature available called RTL module referencing. So RTL module referencing allows you to add an already existing RTL file into a block diagram as an IP. And it will then, once, once you go through the process, it will have this RTL marking on it. To do RTL module referencing in the IP integrator, you need to add that RTL file to the project first. And then by right-clicking anywhere on the design canvas and clicking add module, you can add an RTL module in, in the current block design. And you can just follow the steps to convert your RTL into an IP. One thing to note though is, is that if you change your RTL file and, and the module name changes, the, the the reference module instance must be deleted from the block design and you, you have to you have to add a new one. Similarly, block design module referencing allows you to also add a block design as a module into another block design. And the steps to do that are shown here. So the main advantage of this is that it eliminates the need for manually packing a block design into an IP. 
this can be useful for larger designs where multiple team members are working on different, la on different large blocks or for design reuse among different projects. Okay, so we've talked a little about the Zinc MPSOC architecture. We've talked a little bit about designing with the IP integrator. So now it's time to, to customize and build a basic MPSOC system using the IP integrator within the Vivado design suite. So we'll create a Vivado project, we'll create a block design using the IP integrator, customize the Zinc Ultrascale plus MPSOC, add some peripherals, build the system, build and implement FPGA, and finally export the hardware, which will then which we can then use during the next webinar session for some further software development. So I'm going to switch over to Vivado Design Suite, which I had already opened. So you'll see there are two ways to um, create a project. So either the quick start menu or we just go file project new. It opens up the new project wizard. And as it says here, it will guide, you, guide us through the creation of a new project. Well, why don't we do that? Let me just pause sync MPSOC. This is okay, the path. We'll want to create a project subdirectory. It is an RTL project, because remember, we still need to generate an RTL wrapper for the block design. We're not going to specify additional sources because we don't have any. Click next. For the demo and for, for bringing up this hardware, we will be using a ZCU102 evaluation board. So I will just select that here, click next, and then we, we arrive at the project summary. So a new project will be created based on, on the Zinc Ultrascale Plus ZCU102, which has the XC, XCZU9EG part on it <clears throat> in this package. So we'll click finish. So once the project is created, you're in the Vivado design environment of this project. Now the Vivado design suite has a lot of features. Many of them we won't actually cover in today's session, but rather we'll focus on the IP integrator tool <clears throat> as we'll use this to build the MPSOC. So here on the left-hand side, you'll see the flow navigator, which provides you access to all the high level operations that can be performed on the design, such as RTL, synthesis, implementation, generating the bitstream, etc. Sources window this provides you automated source file management, which is divided into some tabs. So once we start adding some sources, we should see this being populated. At the bottom, we have access to the tickle console where we can also do manual commands to run particular tasks. We have information on the design runs, messages, log outputs. And then here on the right-hand side, a little bit of a project summary, the settings, project settings, some synthesis implementation settings, and some, some summary, result summary. We don't have results yet because we have not run anything yet. So the board that we will be working with is the ZCU102. So let's start by creating a block design for the NPSOC, or let's call this Zinc NPSOC underscore BD block design. Okay, and this will now open the design canvas. As mentioned, so there is easy access to IP by clicking the plus button. There is also, this is the same, you have the same access as the, the IP catalog here. So this is the same. So if I, for instance, click on Zinc and BSOC here, it, it will ask me to add it to the block design or to customize it. If, 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 you, if you customize it, it will actually just add it as, uh, in an, as an IP source for integration in a top level, but we, we don't really need that. So let me just close that. Let me just add it from here. And I'll just double click. <clears throat> and here we have the Zinc Ultra Scale plus MPSOC block. Now you can already see the, the tool has identified that it can provide some designer assistance or run some block automation. So, so let's just see what that is. Have to click here. 
Okay. So because I have selected a ZCU 102 evaluation board, it's asking me to apply some board presets. So it probably means it's going to already enable some peripherals such as Ethernet or UART. Um, so, so I'll click yes, because we actually want to use that. Okay, so, so you'll see it actually has changed some of the input and output ports on this um, IP block. Let's see what they are. So we have, what we can see here on the right-hand side, we have Toe Master AXI high-performance ports coming from the full power domain, driving out of the PS into the programmable logic. So these, these AXI master ports, they need to have a clock associated with it. So they, you can see these here on the left-hand side. So we'll need to, we'll need to drive these clock inputs for, for this AXI master port. We also have an, in, an interrupt input, and we have a program of a logic reset signal coming out of here, as well as a program of a logic clock. We'll, but we have nothing to connect it to yet, so we'll, we'll just leave that as is for now. So in order to customize this block, we can either right mouse click and do customize block, or you can just double click it, which is a lot faster. So let's just do that. When we double click it, you'll see a top level block diagram for the Zinc Ultra Scale Plus MPSOC, and you'll see a, a bunch of colors here. So in the upper right hand corner, you'll see a key with, with the various colors. And, and what, it, what it represents is that for these orangey colored blocks, it means that they, they, are, they, they are present in the full power domain. So the APU, you see the APU, which contains the, four, the two or four uh, A53 processors, uh, cache coherent interconnect interface, and some, some switch blocks, and, and this block here on the right, which contains some peripheral units. Now, these, this is actually part of the PL, and it does not belong to the processing system, but, but it is shown here anyway. Similarly, to all the blocks belonging to the full power domain, the olive green looking color represents the low power domain. So the low power domain consists of, of, of elements in the low, low power domain are the RPO, the switch block for that. You have a switch block um, going into the input output unit, as well as the CSU and PMU, which are the two triple redundant microblaze processes. Then you'll also see these light green colored blocks. And when you hover over it, you see the color change a bit. That means these blocks are configurable. So for the blocks inside the input output unit, for instance, this is, this is how you can connect these peripherals, peripheral units to the outside world. So let's have a look at that, for instance. Let's say we have USB 1, which is not connected to the outside world yet. We can just click on it and, and, and immediately your view changes. And we can enable connectivity to the outside world by just clicking on it. And we can normally then select some IO pins as well. Now what's happened here is you'll see this in red. This means there is a conflict with another peripheral that's enabled. And that is because not all peripherals can be enabled at the same time. Because as the name suggests here, it's an MIO pin. M stands for multiplex. So it's a multiplexed IO. Mm -hmm. And obviously, depending on the device, you have limited amount of package pins available. So that means you cannot always have all peripherals enabled. So, so but for, for our purpose, we, we, we don't really care about this right now because we won't use this. So in order to go back to the top level block diagram, we'll just click on, on this, this little fella here. And so we're back. So the IO configuration where we just were actually allows you to configure some of the standard and commonly used low speed peripherals and memory interfaces such as QSPY, SD for, for booting, for uh, some IO peripherals, such as I2C, UART. So let's check. Okay, we have our two UARTs enabled already. This is good because this is what I would like to demo later on. 
some high speed peripherals as well. So there are four gigabit ethernet blocks in here as well. And I see there is one enabled. This is good because during the last session we'll bring up ethernet on Linux and some, some other PCIe, SATA, et cetera. Then there is the clock configurations, which helps you identify the input clock and specify the input clock, as well as the output clocks that run through the low power domain, as well as through the full power domain. Now you'll mostly only be interested in playing around with the PL fabric clock. So, so as, as you've seen in this block diagram, we have that PL clock zero coming out here. That's the one coming out of this PLL. So you should be aware that I think there are there are about five different PLLs available in the PS that can aid you to generate additional clocks to, uh, from the PS into the PL. And this, this can save you an additional pin on the board. Obviously, if you can synthesize it based on that PS reference clock, but, but um, so, so you can actually use the you know, leverage these, these PLLs in the PS to, to synthesize more clocks. And there is the DDR configuration, as well as the PL, PSPL configuration, which has some general signals such as the interrupts between the two. And the most interesting one will be the PSPL interfaces. So if we drop down, we have our master interfaces, our slave interfaces, and as you recall, here in our board preset, there are two master AXI high performance ports driving out of the P PS into the PL. So for, for our design, we only, need, we only need one. So I'm going to disable that one. And you can, you can drop down even more and you can specify the width. Now our peripherals that we're going to add won't really need 128 bits or 32 bit will be more than enough, as well as the slave interfaces. So the slave interfaces rely on a master residing in the PL, driving into resources into the PS, which can be IO resources, but can also be DDS. So for instance, here there are the two high performance ports or cash cash ports or the high performance ports here which drive directly into DDR memory. So because we've now disabled the second AXI high performance port coming from the full power domain, if we click OK, the the signal has disappeared here. So I'm actually pretty happy with the if we just double double check again, I'm actually pretty happy with the configuration because we've added, we have, let's see, let's check in the IO configuration. We have, there is D card. One is enabled. Um, I want to have this enabled because we will be booting Linux from this SD card during the last session. We have gigabit ethernet enabled. We have a UART enabled. So, so that, that, that's, I'm pretty happy with that. So while you could now generate a wrapper for it and start building an FPGA system or, or, or a bitstream, well, let's make this a little bit more interesting, just, just for fun, right? Um, so we can add some IP from the catalog. This can be, we'll start with some very basic IP, something like an XE GPIO. And again, uh, 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 the tools have identified that they're now uh, is a potential connection between this master port here and the slate port here. So it's asking, it's offering to the designer assistance again. Now I won't do this because that will just make it straight connection. So I'm going to add, let, let's say another one, just exactly the same, GPIO. And, and we run this assistance now. I will click all for all the automation and we'll just deselect that one. I'll show you why in a minute. So click OK. And all of a sudden, that this diagram has become, I wouldn't say complex, but there are a few, few things added here. So you'll see we had this PL clock coming out of the processing system. This is now used to drive all 
the peripherals as well as the reset, but this reset goes through this processor system reset block, which is pretty much like a reset sequencer. And then you have the reset for all the peripheral blocks. Now, because we've added two AXI slaves, even though they're very basic AXI GPIO, but we've added two AXI slaves in the system, and there was only one AXI master coming out of the PS, this one, the tools have automatically inserted this AXI interconnect as well, which, which is then this one drives that AXI GPIO and that master port then drives that master GPIO. So what, what's also been automated is the GPIO output to the outside world. So this would become a pin at the top level. Now, if you don't do the automation, as I mentioned, this, is, this becomes like schematic drawing almost. So you can click on it, right mouse click, make external. So it's created that external. And here in the external interface properties, I can change the name. So the other one was the dip switches. So let's call these. Enter. We'll need to customize these as well. So these are the dip switches, which is okay. And let's let's call these the LEDs for this is for the ZTU102, but if, if if they're custom, you can obviously customize this block for your specific needs of GPIO, for instance. So if you just go back, LED eight bits, which is fine. Also, from within here, you have access to a more complicated IP let's say 10, 25 gigabit ethernet subsystem, or if you are working with external ADCs DACs, which run JESD, for instance, you have access to JESD IP. So this can become quite a complex block. But what I'll do now is I will save this. I will actually I will, I'll want to want, I'll want to add one more block, and that's something called System ILA. System ILA is an integrated logic analyzer, which allows you to debug your design. So it can it can accept basic signals, native it's called. So it's sort of you can monitor any signal in the design, but you can also monitor AXI transactions. So by just Let's say in the next session, we'll build an application which, which will exercise uh, this, this GPIO module here. So if we then want to make sure that the transactions coming out of here and out of here going into this block are correct, then we can actually debug this at a real low level by, by hooking up this one. We'll just click on it and drag it, and I can hook that up. Again, designer assistance available. Well, I suppose it just wants to hook up the clock and reset now. So yeah, that's fine. So so this is now a built up, a small, easy built up system which we can maybe now run. And then, but but you also sometimes when it becomes a big system and the schematic becomes a little bit unclear to follow because you'll see you have some loops here and you have various views here that you can explore. So for instance, if you only want to see your X interfaces or your, as well as your external, external interfaces, you can click on interfaces view and that simplifies your diagram. You can do no loops and that will kind of try to make everything a little bit more straight, etc. So, so this is something you can play around with based on your preference. There is a second tab here, which has the address editor as discussed. So we have two axis slave peripherals in the design. They are mapped to this, these addresses within the address space of the PS. You can modify these and call that, we can make that a toe. Um, here it's complaining already. Okay, so I can't do that. So I'll just leave it as it is. Anyway, I won't try to figure out a correct address, but there you go. So I was already trying to do something wrong. Um, you can, for instance, exclude this. This might be useful if, if, if you have a use case where, you, where your software will not talk to this peripheral, but you do not wish to change the hardware and leave the block connected and everything, then you can just simply exclude it from the memory map. Now, I've not, I've not come across this quite often, that, that people would not want to talk to a peripheral in their design, but any, anyhow, that's... <laughs> It's possible. 
still on the sign. Okay, a sign. Okay, so that, that's fine. So this is now, I'm pretty happy with this design, so I'll save this. I will, I can then validate the design, but by just right clicking anywhere on the canvas, it allows you all, it shows you all these options available. You can also do that from the sources window. You'll see that now we have a block design, We've created a block design with all these IPs in it. So you have a hierarchical overview. And we can validate, have I validated this? No, not yet. So we can validate this design. Okay, no errors or critical warning. So it has done all the design rule checks, the DSCs, and it's, it's found no errors. So this is pretty good. In order to now build an FPGA bitstream, as discussed during the slides, you cannot, it still needs to be wrapped in an RTL wrapper. So again, here, the, the, this is available to you by right mouse clicking on the block design and you generate, create an HDL wrapper. But just let Vivado manage it and auto update. And you'll, at the bottom here, you'll see all the tickle commands that it executes to do all of that. So, which can be pretty handy if you wish to move to a tickle based environment. And you'll see it's updated the hierarchy that has generated a VHDL file automatically. And if we open that, we have a wrapper for it. So if you wish to only work with this type of design, this is perfectly fine. You can either import RTL modules, as mentioned like this, module type RTL or a block design, which is RTL module referencing or block design referencing. You can import that in here, or if you have a large design and a, a, a legacy RTL design and you just wish to add this, then you can also simply instantiate this block in your top level VHDL file or Verilog file or system Verilog, whatever, whatever is your preference. Now, the last thing we need to do is generate the output products. And there are various ways to do that. So this will actually synthesize the design, generate all the files. There are synthesis options. It's global and out of context. Now global, global will resynthesize everything, all the IP in your diagram. So if you if you set this to global, generate output products. Every time it generates the output products, it will resynthesize all IP. Whereas if you only select out of context per IP. Then it will only resynthesize the IP that you recustomize, or if any adjacent IPs are affected, it will it will resynthesize them as well. So, so I'll just do it out of context because it'll save us a bit of time. But because this is the first time, it will still have to go through this. So this might actually take a bit of time. So while this is figuring out what it wants to do, it says generate all of this stuff. Um, output product, so see here it's going to start the run, analyzing the files and this is so. Um, Okay, so so now you'll see there are a number of design runs here. So we said we said the, there is an out of context module run for our block design, which is now synthesizing all those IPs. So <clears throat> this will now run for five minutes. We'll we'll come back to this to the Vivado design suite in a minute. But before we come back, I, I'd just like to to present a little a little thing on on the 
debug features within the Vivado design suite. Now I, I plonk this thing in here, but I haven't really explained sort of what it can do. So, so let me go back to my slides and, and explain a little bit about Vivado debug cores. So, so there are several debug cores available in Vivado that you can incorporate in the design, which will help you debug your design. So in one of these is the system ILA core, an integrated logic analyzer core, and it can be used to monitor anything. So the signals are connected to the ILA core clock and, and probe inputs. And an ILA, then this is pretty much like a, like a logic analyzer, right? It includes Boolean trigger equations, edge, edge transition triggers, and you can specify the parameters such as sample depth, which of the probe input, you can specify the number of probes. There are up to 1,023 probes available in an ILA core, so you can actually hook up quite a significant amount of signals. Obviously, the more, the more signals and the more sample depth you choose, the more block RAM it will chew, it will chew up on, on, on in the design. So it's adding a debug core is useful for debugging, but it's, it's not used for, for production um, FPGA builds. It's not, not recommended. Once you add the debug core, which is what we've, what we've added now to the block design, or what you won't see is that an auto instantiated debug core it, it provide, that provides an interface between JTAG and, and, of, uh, and, and the debug core in the Vivado design suite. So this happens. During the after synthesis, uh, a debug core hub is instantiated, and there is only one available of them, and it connects to your synthesized design netlist automatically. But you, the only thing you must ensure that the, the clock going into the debug hub is, is a free running clock. So this is something you specify by, by adding some constraints. So, uh, as mentioned, actually, we haven't looked at the customization for this right so if i click on this so this is you customize it you can see we, we are going to monitor an interface an x interface but if you change this to native you can directly hook up some signals which, which can be anything you can configure it to monitor certain types of transactions uh, the number of outstanding read and write transactions, et cetera. So, so this is, there is a recustomization window available for this as well. And then once you build the FPGA bitstream and connect, download the bitstream, connect to the target, you'll have an, an integrated logic analyzer dashboard. And that shows you number of windows, such as the trigger mode settings, the capture mode settings, some, some status information the capture setup and the trigger setup and waveform. So, so it's not like a traditional logic analyzer. Another debug core is the virtual input output, also customizable. And, and, and this one can not only monitor signals, but it can also drive internal signals in, F, in the FPGA in real time. So unlike the ILA core, the integrated logic analyzer, there is no on-chip or on-chip, off-chip memory required. And what this does, it presents and captures data on the design clock attached to the clock input port to the sample data. So it can insert virtual pins and produce up to 65 input and output probes. And each of these ports can also be 256 bits wide. So imagine you want to start off a a sequence of events so you can get pretty much just toggle bits or and but then also monitor signals and in, into it again also here there is a dashboard available that shows you all the status and control bits for a given vio core for instance i won't explain that one the one that i've i've always found very useful and it's just quite common is the JTAG to XE master core, which is also customizable and can be, can be added to a block design. It's very handy for embedded systems, but also non-embedded systems. And it is, can be used to generate a, AXI transactions, but then from, from the command line, from tickle console. Um, and it is particularly useful when, when you have a scenario where 
software and hardware engineers are working on things in parallel <clears throat> and software driver software may not be available or not entirely ready yet hardware engineers wish to test their design test the peripherals and make sure that they can communicate with everything so using the vivado hardware manager you can connect your jtag to your peripherals pretty much through this jtag to xe master and there is there are a number of ways to, to just issue via a simple command line interface, issue some read and write transactions to all the peripherals. Now this can perfectly sit alongside the PS and it won't conflict <clears throat> because it, it'll have its own address space. So to, the final thing we'll do shortly is the export of the hardware, of the generated hardware which is required to start software development. And it can be done in two ways. It can be done before or after bitstream generation. Now, I, I recommend to do it after bitstream generation because then when you export it and you import it in the Vitus IDE, then you, can, then you have your bitstream available and you can program the, the FPGA from within the Vitus IDE as well. But, but, but the format of this hardware is in this hardware definition file or, or the XSA, the Xilinx Support Archive, which is nothing but a container or, or it's a zip file, which, which contains all the information that is needed to build a platform in, in the Vitus IDE or, or, or with Peta Linux. And, and this file has the hardware specification, such as the processor configuration properties, peripheral connection information, the address map, as well as some device initialization code. So these files, uh, they contain the initialization code and, 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 and settings for things such as um, the DDR, clocks, PLLs, MIOs, etc. And Vitus uses these settings when initializing the system so that the applications can run on top of that, of that system. <clears throat> so there's two ways to do this from within Vivado. We'll go back there in a minute and just either click file, export the hardware, or there is also a tickle command that right hardware platform so that tickle command can be okay we're finished here which is nice so you can do that from within the tickle console file hardware platform right hardware platform but you can also just do file export hardware next include bitstream now we don't have a bitstream so i can't do that yet so now that all of these are synthesized though i'm going to generate a bitstream now this will take five to 10 minutes. <clears throat> so so we, we can conclude the sessions, but then next week we'll pick this up. But then when I now do file export hardware, and I do without the bitstream, it will create that XSA file and I call it sync NPSOC BD wrapper XSA. So that's fine. I click finish. And then I have that XSA file available for software development during the next session with Vitus. Now, now the, the XSA file is something you'll hear me bring up a lot, um, but, but that obviously is, is the basis for, for all further software development. So I can let this run now. This is now synthesizing the design. Um, it will generate a bitstream. I will export that again so that I have an XSA file which has the bitstream included as well. But see now it's actually doing the FPGA build, which consists of synthesis as well as FPGA implementation. Now what's beyond the scope of these sessions, as mentioned before, is, is working a little bit with the back end um, once the results are ready to perform analysis of the design in terms of timing and timing closure, etc. So I think this is where we can leave off the session. We are ready to, we have exported the design, so we can import that during the next webinar session using Vitus SDK. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much um, for your patience with the technical difficulties. And I think we should now be open for a Q and A session if, if, there is, if there are some questions. Thank you very much. Back to Jamie. Yep, no worries. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Christoph. Um, so, 
Yeah, just to, uh, to follow up on this, uh, we're not showing any Q&A um, in the chat window. Um, we will be sending um, out uh, some emails <clears throat> with um, how you can access the, uh, the recorded session. Um, please do join us on the second uh, session, which will take this hardware that's been um, developed um, and we'll build on that. And yeah, please feel free to reach out to either myself or Ali. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll, uh, we'll chat with you on the next session. Um, anything from yourself, Ali, or you all good? No, okay. it's okay. Thank you very much for their attendance. All right. Thank you very much, guys. And yeah, once again, thanks for, uh, for all your patience. Oh, hang on. Wait, we've got some questions here. Um, how can we access the presentation? So I will, um, we've been recording these and we'll send these um, out um, to everybody that's attended. Um, oh, are you aware that the chat window is disabled? My page, oh, right. My, my sincere apologies. Um, was not aware that the chat window was disabled. I wondered why it was a little quiet. Um, so elaborating a bit on the JTAG AXI module and how to drive it. Okay. Um, hmm. So um, do you want to answer that live or shall we send out a... Um, 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 so so uh, let me share my slides again. Um, there is a, so here, if you, this, this link here, I can answer the question, but this link here will actually, there's a video, it's a 10 minute video provided by Xilinx, which is really good, the JTAG to Axi Master Core. And at the end of this, so let me just mute this, but at the end of this, it will, it will show you how to actually, what the syntax is for that hardware Axi transaction sort of thing. So, um, if I go back to Vivado, is that ready yet? No, it's not. Um, so I could have opened the hardware. When, once you open the hardware manager from within here, so obviously you don't need to move on to using Vitus and running the PS. So you can open the hardware manager, open target through your JTAG connection. And then once you open the hardware target, you should see your JTAG to Axi master. So if I add this here, I won't do it now, but if you'll see that once you add this JTAG to Axi Master, this will kind of sit next to, and, and the tools will automatically add another slave port here, and that slave port will become your second master. And then once you once you build the, the bit stream and you, you program it, then you should be able to connect to it and then go through, if you can go through this video, which is very, very useful, and then it shows you how to run the transactions just to perform simple reads and writes. Now, what you'll need to do, see now there's two networks here. The one is the one master for the PS, is another one for JTAG AXI, which, have a diff, which will have a different memory address, right? So this is, you'll just need to check the addresses for your slaves in here, because they won't be the same addresses as the PS. So, but that that's kind of, it's, it's fairly straightforward. Um, why don't I do that actually? So what you'll see now you have, it's added a second slave port here on this, on this Axie interconnect. So you can, so software, while software development's ongoing, if not ready yet, you can drive read and write transactions to all of those peripherals yourself by using this JTAG to Axi Master. And then you don't even need fighters. You can just open the hardware manager, program the bitstream, and then and then follow the instructions as per this video, and then it should, should be good to go. Um, does that answer the question? I think, yeah, just to follow up on um, what Christoph has just gone through, um, obviously, this is um, the first couple of sessions um, targeting, you know, building a simple system, you know, simple real world system and getting that up and running. Um, we did seek some feedback 
um, very early on. And certainly um, debug sessions um, is something um, that has been requested. Um, so very definitely will be something that we um, tailor another webinar um, around where, you know, where um, we are aware there is, uh, you know, demand out there in terms of um, interest um, for these kind of sessions. So bear with us while we find our feet and, um, you know, develop some more um, material. But, you know, by all means, you know, if you're working on something right, you know, right away kind of thing, then feel free to uh, reach out to, uh, to us. And um, you know we can we can uh, chat with you directly. Uh, so there is an uh, okay no uh, answer on the um, Axi uh, JTAG to Axi Master core. Just saying thanks. That uh, helps a lot. Um, so I don't see any other questions here. So um, yeah, if there's any more, please. Uh, type away. Um, otherwise, you know, we'll give it a couple of minutes and uh, um, we'll drop off and uh, yeah, thanks. Thanks very much for, uh, for your valuable time. Okay. All right, I think we can go. Yeah, thanks very much, everybody. Appreciate it. And thanks yeah, the next, the next session is the 2nd of September. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye.